recording. There's a benefit to being here today is that you got to hear that little last statement. And the people that are at home listening to this right now are wondering, what the hell did he say? Is it on the test? Yes, it is on the test. Okay. I know, right? But you know the secret. So let's get into this. So this tool we used in lab, we actually used a little thing called a Spiro pad. It's a, a tiny handheld version of this. But this thing's called a spirometer, and it measures air flow. And the air flowing out or bre breathed out into a breath, they can measure that, how much volume is moving. It's kind of cool how it works. So why do they plug the nose? Because there's no valve in there preventing air from c coming out your nose. When you exhale, there's nothing keeping it from coming out the nose. The only way you can stop the flow out of the nose is to plug the nose. So by plugging the nose, you isolate all of the air coming out of the lungs to the mouth. And you can blow in this tube. As, this, as you're blowing in this tube, the air comes down. It goes up into this little hollow cylinder. And the cylinder, the more air it has in it, the more it rises above this water that's surrounding it. So it's just like having a little, like a cup upside down in water. If you start blowing air underneath it, the cup will start rising. And we can measure how much air fills that cylinder, that cup, with this little string that's attached in the top. So it's kind of a cool device. And then this thing's called a spirogram where it's actually written out. It's like um, an electrocardiograph is the actual machine. An electrocardiogram is the picture. And it's just waves of going up and down. So when you breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, and you can measure where the airflow is going. Here are the four lung volumes you have to know. So we talked about them in lab, or if you have lab today, we'll talk about them again in lab. But you have to know these. The first one's called tidal volume, and this is the normal relaxed breath. This is just like if you're sitting on the beach, what are you watching move when you're relaxed? The tides, right? You watch the tide come in, tide go out. You're breathing. I had a shiatsu instructor that he would always go, breathe in, ah, breathe out. <laughs> and I love listening to his accent. It was just hilarious. He was from Japan and been practicing for 25 years, and to listen to him was just amazing. Um, Another thing is breaths. He could never say breaths. It was always breaths. So when you'd watch her, her chest rise and fall with her breaths, so, oh, look at her. She has beautiful breaths. He meant breaths. <laughs> right? I won't tell you what was going on in my mind. But anyway, so tidal volume is the, the relaxed breath in, breath out, breath in. Every time you take a relaxed breath, if you're the average person, you move about a half liter, which is 500 milliliters. And I always, when I hear liters, I always visualize like bottles of, of soda, or in Iowa you call them pop, whatever. So imagine a two liter bottle of soda. In one breath, you breathe one quarter of that. That's how much air you move at one time. That's your tidal volume on average. And it doesn't matter if you have a disease that affects the lungs or not, you still need to keep the tidal volume about the same. Why? What's the tidal volume there for? Just to keep you alive. Yeah, it's the basic airflow that you need just to stay alive. So everybody's going to have about the same tidal volume. People that have diseases, they may struggle to get that tidal volume, but they're still going to try and keep it around the same. Next is inspiratory reserve. This is the reserve space of your lungs that you can breathe in extra, right? Inspiratory reserve. So let's say you take a normal breath, you relax out, you take a normal breath, and then suddenly you take a gasp. All the extra air that you brought in to maximally fill your lungs is the inspiratory reserve volume. Sometimes, I like to imagine going underwater. So you're getting ready to go underwater. You take a couple normal breaths, you take a couple deep breaths, and then right before you under, you take this <gasps> as much as you can possibly breathe in, and then you go under. That extra that you can breathe in beyond a normal breath is called the inspiratory reserve, and the average is around 3,000. I'm not going to make you memorize these numbers. The tidal volume is probably the only significant one that you would ever want to remember. So if you're a great swimmer or whatever, your inspiratory reserve is probably going to be bigger than the average person. Like, I think Michael Phelps, that guy could probably suck in like five liters at a time. I, every time I think of him now, I just think of marijuana. So if, if you're in Colorado where it's legal, you definitely don't want to be after him, right? Nobody gets that. So that inspiratory volume, if you're a smoker, <gasps> that's the stuff you breathe in, where you get all that good, nasty crap in your lungs. Number three, expiratory reserve volume, or ERV. It's just the opposite of inspiratory reserve. Take a normal breath, relax it, 
and then when you cough or you exhale forcefully, <sighs> now I smell like, or smell, sound like a smoker. When you breathe out all that you could possibly bring out, that's the expir expiratory reserve. That's everything beyond a normal breath, normal tidal volume. When you do that and you've blown out everything you possibly can, is there any air left in your lungs? Yes, there's an amount of air that you can never blow out completely, and it's called the residual volume. It's the leftover amount. Your lungs don't collapse and just smash perfectly flat when you blow out as hard as you can. They shrink down to a minimal volume, but there's still air in there, and that air left over is residual. So these are four volumes. If you put them on a spirogram like this, I'm going to jump ahead, the volumes never overlap. So here's your IRV. When you take that maximal breath up here, everything down to a normal tidal volume is your IRV, your inspiratory reserve. Here's your tidal volume. It starts where IRV ends and goes down to the end of normal breath, the, the passive expiration. Then if you blow out firmly, that's the ERV. The extra you can blow out beyond tidal volume. Notice how they're not overlapping. They come up to the next one and stop. To the next one and stop. To the next one and stop. And why don't you see any waves dipping down in the RV? Because that's air you can't move, right? This graph is showing you the movement of air. Breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. Deep, bre deep breath in, <gasps> breathing out. <sighs> Deep breath in, or a little breath in, and then maximally exhaling. All the way down. This is what's left when you've maximally exhaled, the residual volume. The four volumes don't overlap. They touch each other on the graph, but they don't overlap. The next are the four capacities. Capacities are two volumes, at least two volumes, calculated together. So when I was remembering these, I looked at inspiratory capacity and functional residual. They're exactly the opposite. If you took this graph and you split it in half, so you take the top two volumes, the IRV plus the TV, that's your inspiratory capacity. That's a good breath in. Passive relaxation, and then deeply breathe in. <gasps> you bring the tidal volume in, you bring the inspiratory reserve volume in, together those two add up to the IC, inspiratory capacity. The bottom two volumes, the ERV and the RV, come out to the functional residual capacity. So to remember the top two, I always just think, this one, the inspiratory capacity, is the top half of the graph. The functional residual is the bottom half of the graph. The vital capacity, vital is referring to life. This is the living breath. This is how much breath you can move to stay alive. All you have to think about is think about all the air you can move. What's the only one of those volumes you can't move? The residual. So if you look at all the air you can move on this graph, it just added all together but get rid of the residual because you can't move it. So vital capacity would be your inspiratory reserve, your tidal volume, and your ERV all added together. When I think of this, I think, if I were in a competition to blow up a balloon, and all I have to do is beat you, what am I going to do? I'm going to take the deepest breath I possibly can, put the balloon up to my mouth, and do what? Just puff out a little bit? I'm going to exhale everything I possibly can blow out. So I'll take a deep breath, and then I'll start blowing. I've blown from the maximal. I've gotten rid of my IRV. My TV's gone out. I'm kind of struggling here. I'm squeezing. I'm bending over, hunching over, trying to smash my lungs as much as I can, get the ERV out, and then I stop. I can't get any more out. If you measure the volume that's in that balloon right now, that's your IRV plus your TV plus your ERV. That's what we call the vital capacity, the amount you can move for life. And then the last one, you take a deep breath as much as you can, plug your nose, and we take an x-ray of your chest. Snap. We measure the volume of your chest when you have as much air as you possibly can at one time in it. That's the total lung capacity. So again, the volumes, if it ends in a V for volume, they never overlap. There are four of them on this graph. So you start at IRV, to the TV, to the ERV, and then the RV. The capacities always overlap. Capacity is always adding at least two volumes together. The IC are the top two volumes. The FRC are the bottom two volumes. The vital capacity are the top three that you can move for life. And the total lung capacity just add all four volumes together. What do you think would happen if you had a disease that had a lot of scar tissue around your lungs? What do you think would happen to the total lung capacity? It's going to decrease. If you have something like 
pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial fibrosis where you have pulmonary is referring to what organ? The lungs, fibrosis is telling you what's happening. There's scarring, there's fibrotic tissue around it. It's almost like if you took a vest, a really, really tight vest, or if you're a woman, you know what a corset is, right? And tightening that sucker up so you can't completely inhale. That's what it would be, it would be like having pulmonary fibrosis. Your total lung capacity goes down. You can't take a full, complete breath like a normal person can. The RV stays about the same. Everything else has to shrink. If you had something like emphysema, you ever looked at their chest? It's huge. They've been breathe deeping in, but they never get all the air out. So what have they actually done to their total lung capacity? They've increased it. They've stretched it out. But the problem is I said that they can't get all that air out. What increased? Other than total lung capacity, what else increased here? The RV, the residual volume, they can't get that out. What do you think that RV's full of? What do you want to get out of your lungs? CO2, right? It's packed with CO2. It's low in good oxygen and it's high in CO2. So that's why these values are really important is because when you have diseases, you're going to see different changes in these. Like somebody with asthma, there's nothing wrong with their lungs. It's the airway that's the problem. So would you expect a total lung capacity to change in asthma? No. But when they're having an asthma attack, we call this, this disease, they can't get all the air out. So what would change if they can't get all the air out? that residual volume again. It's an obstructive disease. They can't get all the air out because their airway is squeezing down. So imagine that you have like one of those gigantic straws for milkshakes and then suddenly you have one of those little twizzle straws like you stir your coffee with. That's the big difference. And you already know this. If you shrink the radius of that airway, what do you do to the resistance? You increase it. What's going to happen to the airflow? You decrease the airflow. So you're going to see a big change in the residual volume. Their lung their total lung capacity doesn't change so much, but the amount that they can move out easily does change. All right, so next is FEV, and we weren't able to test this in lab this semester, but forced expiratory volume is how much air you can blow out in one second if it says FEV1. If it says FEV2, it's how much can you blow out in two seconds, and then FEV3 is how much you can blow out in three seconds. They're testing the speed of airflow through your lungs. What do you think would happen to the speed of airflow in asthma? You think it would get faster or slower? It would get slower. So this is a significant value when you're looking at how able these people are to get air out of their lungs. Most people with an FEV1, if you're just an average person, you should have at least over 80% of your lung volume moves in one second. So if you went and blew into this tube, within the first second you should have 80% of your maximal flow out. Within two seconds, you should have 95%, and within three seconds, you should have 100%. So what would happen to that 80% in something like emphysema, where they can't get all the air out? It would drop. You'd see something like maybe 70% or 65%, and that's a sign that they have some kind of an obstructive pulmonary disorder. They can't get all the air out of their lungs. So that's the significance of FEV, how fast you can push air out of your lungs. If you shrink the size of the airway, like an asthma, you can't get the air out as fast. All right, so after a normal expiration, the volume of air that's left in the lungs would be called what? After a normal expiration, passive expiration, what's left in your lungs? I forgot to look at the time when we started to match that clock up because it's always like somewhere between three minutes and seven minutes off, but I'm never ever actually sure. So it's 116. Yeah, so it's like 12 minutes off now. All right. So what is it? Look at your neighbor and tell them why you're right. I'm kind of curious to see how many people have the same answer. Tell them why you're right. Would you like to talk to me about it? How'd you know that? You're a smart cookie? That is absolutely it. You're right.
This is a tricky one. This gets a lot of people. Right. So how about number one? Is it inspiratory capacity? No. It's talking about expiration, right? At the end of normal expiration, you've already expired that stuff out. So inspiratory ca capacity can't be that. How about FRC? Maybe. How about residual volume? Is that left in the lungs after you've taken a normal breath out? The residual volume is always in the lungs, right? So you know that's in there. How about expiratory reserve volume? At a normal breath out, <sighs> at the end of tidal volume, what's left in your lungs? Is ERV still left in your lungs? Yes. There are three possible answers here. So which one is the right one? Number two. Why is number two the right answer? Because number two is number three plus number four. So residual volume is left, but expiratory reserve volume is left. You add those together, and that comes out to functional residual capacity. So number two is the correct answer. It's a tricky one. If you don't like questions like that, you'll hate the NCLEX or the MCAT. I'm just telling you right away. Because they ask questions like, which is the best, right? So they'll give you three possible answers that could be right, but which is the best one? Okay, respiratory dysfunctions. And that's why you do a spirometer is you're trying to measure flow and volumes. You're trying to see, does this person have a normal set of lungs or do they have some kind of respiratory dis disorder? There are two major groups we're going to talk about. One's obstructive and the other's restrictive. Obstructive, the key to remembering this is that they can't get the air out. It doesn't matter what the cause is. If they can't get the air out, it's obstructive. So it doesn't matter if it's the actual lungs that are problematic or if it's the airway that's problematic. If they can't get their air out, it's obstructive. Restrictive means they can't get the air in, right? Their lungs are less compliant. What was compliant? Stretchability. That means their lungs are less stretchable, which means they probably have a lot of what that restricts stretch? Scar tissue. So restrictive would be something like interstitial fibrosis or pulmonary fibrosis I mentioned earlier. Obstructive is a little bit more broad. What would be one way you can't get air out is if you have what disorder? These people have a problem getting the air out. Asthma. That's a tricky one because a lot of times you think, well, they can't breathe in. It's actually the breathing out that's the bigger problem. If, you, if, if you're watching somebody with asthma and they start having an asthma attack, if you close your eyes and listen, they're going, <gasps> what are you hearing move? You're hearing the inward, the in inspiration. You're good at inspiring. You, you put power into breathing in every time you take a breath. <gasps> But when you exhale, do you use any energy at all? All you're, letting, all you're doing is letting those muscles relax. It's harder for you to forcefully, forcefully expire than it is to breathe in because you have so much practice breathing in, but you just relax to breathe out. And by the way, if you're around somebody with asthma, don't close your eyes and just listen. Help them, right? <laughs> so asthma is one example. Emphysema is another one. And this was a hard one for me to kind of grasp was emphysema. These people, they have a problem getting the air out. It's nothing like asthma. It's totally different. Asthma is affecting the bronchioles, the airway, but emphysema is actually affecting the alveoli. With these people, they have a big chest. They get lots of air in, but the problem is they can't get what out? It's the CO2. What's interesting is if you watch somebody with emphysema breathe, they purse their lips. If, you, if you've seen buddy, somebody like that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They go, and they're slowly pushing the air out, which to me seems counterintuitive. If they can't get the air out efficiently, why would they be pursing their lips and slowly releasing air? It's not that they're trying to hold, it's not that they're trying to um, hold the CO2 in longer, it's that they're trying to hold what in longer? I'm trying to find a way to word this. The oxygen. They have a problem keeping the oxygen in, right? So they bring the oxygen in and then they hold all this CO2 in that it displaces the oxygen and they blow back out. So what they do is they hold their breath a little bit longer so the oxygen has a chance to get into their bloodstream and get carried away. But unfortunately when they hold oxygen longer they also hold in more CO2. And you already know this, when they hold the CO2 in longer, what else stays in longer? Every time you hear CO2 you should associate it with acid. So the CO2 stays in their blood and in their lungs longer, which means what else stays in their blood longer? Acids. So what state do you usually find that a person with emphysema has going on? Acidosis. There are two types of acidosis. I'm going to 
go with your gut here, would you call that metabolic acidosis or respiratory acidosis? It's a respiratory caused acidosis. I love, I love science because sometimes it tells you the answer right in the name of the, the problem. Respiratory acidosis. There are breathing issues that cause acidosis in their, their body. And we'll talk about that more when we talk about acids and bases. Um, I think it's in like two weeks or three weeks. Okay, so obstructive lung disease versus restrictive. And then bronchitis. Where would you expect that to be? Restrictive or obstructive? Obstructive. Yep. Bronchitis is telling you what's the itis saying? Inflammation, bronch is referring to the bronchi and the bronchioles, right? So they have inflammation of the airway, which squeezes down the airway is going to do what? Is it going to be an obstructive problem where they, it's blocking their ability to move air? Or is it actually physically restricting the lungs? It's the airflow. It's obstructive again. So bronchitis, asthma, emphysema are all obstructive disorders where interstitial fibrosis, pulmonary fibrosis are restrictive. If you've ever heard of COPD, COPD is technically two things. It's emphysema plus, nobody knows this, huh? It's a good thing to remember. It's emphysema plus chronic bronchitis. If you have emphysema, you have emphysema. If you have bronchitis, you have bronchitis. If you have both, you have COPD. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disorders. And it tells you both of those are what kind of disorder? Chronic obstructive disorders. All right, so this is what you might see on a spirogram. In this situation, these people have a raised RV. They can't get this bad air out. What disease should your gut tell you? They can't get the bad air out. It's an obstructive disorder. So emphysema, asthma, their RV raises. Their total lung capacity is still solid. It's plenty of total lung capacity, but the problem is that the bad air stays in. And then with this one, their total lung capacity shrunk. The residual volume stayed the same, but everything else has to shrink as a result. Well, almost everything else. What would you expect to happen to tidal volume? Would it go up, go down, or stay the same? Why would it stay the same? Because that's the amount of air you have to have to stay alive, right? So it doesn't matter what disease you have, this has to stay the same, the tidal volume. You still have to move 500 milliliters of fresh air. But this is restrictive. It's not allowing them to fill their lungs completely. Next thing you should be able to calculate is pulmonary ventilation or minute ventilation. This is the same as talking about cardiac output. With cardiac output, you're taking what two values and adding together, or actually multiplying together. Cardiac output was the amount of blood your heart pumps in one stroke volume times how many times your heart beats in a minute, your heart rate. This is exactly the same concept. Here you're looking at the lungs and air though. So how much your lungs breathe in in one breath, which is what volume? One relaxed breath. Tidal volume times the number of times your lungs pump in one minute. So it's the same concept, you just have to apply it to, uh, to air. So what I like about cardiovascular and respiratory together is because they're really, like all the concepts overlap. They're the same concepts, you just have to apply blood to cardiovascular and air to respiratory. So pulmonary ventilation is your tidal volume times your respiratory rate. So if I'm breathing 500 milliliters per breath and I have 12 breaths a minute, that's 6,000 milliliters in a minute. That's about six liters. That's exactly six liters. Six liters in one minute. So three two liter bottles full of air in one minute. Unfortunately, that's not what's getting into my lungs. Because when you breathe in, you have up and through the nostrils, nasal conch, down into the pharynx, to the larynx, to the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles. Is there exchange of oxygen between blood and the atmosphere in any of those locations? None. The only place you get exchange of oxygen with blood is where? The alveoli. So everything going down to those little tiny alveoli is actually considered dead space. We call it anatomic dead space. You've got about a foot to a foot and a half of anatomical dead space. And on average, it's going to be about 150 milliliters, bless you. So about 150 milliliters. She was just demonstrating the pushing out of expiratory reserve volume. A two, blowing it all out. Okay, so about 150 milliliters of space. So when you breathe in 500 milliliters, 
That last 150 milliliters doesn't make it to your lungs. It goes into your nose, nasal conch, larynx, trachea, etc., all the way down, but then it's blown right back out. It was worthless air, so it's dead air. It's dead space. Unfortunately, that's really good oxygenated air that you just blow right back out. So to get a more accurate, I'm going to jump over this picture. To get a little bit more accurate um, estimate of what makes it into the lungs, take your tidal volume and subtract your dead space. What's left is what gets into the alveoli. So we call this alveolar ventilation. This is how much air gets into the alveoli. If I didn't say this clearly before, ventilation is just getting air into the lungs, right? Can you ventilate a dead person? Yes. You can push their chest up and down and you'll push air in and out. Perfusion is getting blood to the lungs. Does a dead person perfuse to the lungs? No. So are you helping that person get blood through their body? If they're dead, yeah, there's nothing going on there. You can ventilate, but it's not perfusing blood, so there's nothing, there's nothing moving. So alveolar ventilation is how much air gets into the alveoli that's available for exchange into the blood. So you take your tidal volume of 500, subtract 150, comes out to about 350. I keep saying about, that's exactly 350. And then you multiply it by the times, or the number of times they breathe in a minute. So 350 times 12 is 4,200. So in reality, only about two-thirds of the air they breathe in in one minute actually makes it to the lungs. And then, of course, there's alveolar dead space. And this, this is most significant when you look at somebody that has emphysema. Uh, let me go back and show you a picture. So the alveolar dead space, even though you bring this air in, for it to actually get exchanged or diffused into the blood, that oxygen particle here has to go over to the wall and get exchanged. If I bring in oxygen here and I blow it right back out, it was no good. If I have emphysema, we'll say that this alveoli is like five times its normal size. So the air comes into the middle, it's gonna take longer for me to get the oxygen over to the, the wall and get into the blood, which explains why they purse their lips and hold their breath a little bit. It gives the oxygen more time to, to exchange. That whole space in here that is not touching the wall is called alveolar dead space. And somebody with emphysema, that goes up, which means even though they're bringing more air into their lungs, are they exchanging it as well as a normal healthy person? No, because they have all that dead space inside their lungs, those big, huge alveolar pockets that they get no exchange. And then I think I told the garden host story in lab, but, so I won't repeat it. When you're in a lab, you'll hear it. Right, so if I asked you a question like this on a test, which is always possible, or since we talk about this in lab, I might ask it on a lab quiz, but a patient has a tidal volume of 300 milliliters, their dead space is 100 milliliters, so this must be a really short person. And the respiration rate is 20 breaths per minute with a lot of anxiety. What's the pulmonary ventilation? Okay, so which is the right answer? How about number one? So I have some people saying yes. How about number two? I have louder people saying yes. How about number three? Nobody wants to say yes, so let's get rid of number three. How about number four? Nobody wants to say that. So it's kind of split between number one and number two. How do you calculate pulmonary ventilation? You take the tidal volume times respiratory rate. 300 times 20, that's 6,000. That's it. Number one's the correct answer. Why did some people pick 4,000? Because they were calculating alveolar ventilation, right? They were taking the 300 minus the 100 times the 20. That's alveolar ventilation. Don't get tripped up by those two terms. Okay, so next concept. Local control is acting on smooth muscle the airways and arterioles match airflow to the blood flow. Airflow is the ventilation. Blood flow is the perfusion. First slide of the lecture, ventilation versus perfusion. Ventilation is the airflow. Blood flow is perfusion. 
Also notice that it's talking about smooth muscle of the airways and the arterioles. The smooth muscle in the airways control the airflow. Smooth muscle in the arterioles control the blood flow. They're not the same thing. Your lungs have airflow going to the alveoli. They have blood flow going to the alveoli. They overlap. But you can adjust either of these independently. So first, the carbon dioxide effect on bronchiolar smooth muscle. Are we talking about air or blood flow right now? Effect of carbon dioxide on bronchiolar smooth muscle. Airflow or blood flow? Airflow. Air I would underline bronchiolar because the next term says arteriolar. What's that referring to? The blood flow. And this is important because I keep telling you what determines your, your breathing. What's the primary determinant? Airflow, or sorry, carbon dioxide or oxygen? Carbon dioxide is controlling the airflow. It's controlling your breathing. Oxygen has an influence, but oxygen's influence is over blood flow, not the airflow. It's a huge concept. So the effect of carbon dioxide on bronchial or smooth muscle, if you have a lot of carbon dioxide inside your lungs, what do you think your bronchioles are going to want to do? Constrict or dilate? You have a lot of CO2 in your lungs. They're going to dilate. And we already talked about that. If you flip back like a couple pages, we talked about sympathetic and parasympathetic control and also carbon dioxide <laughs> flow on the airway. So an increase in carbon dioxide does what to the bronchioles? dilates them. In other words, a decrease in CO2 would do what to the bronchioles? Constrict them. So if you remember one of those directions, then you just always know the opposite is true when you switch the, uh, the content. So high CO2 causes bronchodilation. What's it do to the smooth muscle then? Does it constrict or relax the smooth muscle? it relaxes it. If you're trying to dilate something, you relax the smooth muscle, it goes all the way around it and it just opens up. So carbon dioxide, higher carbon dioxide relaxes smooth muscle causing bronchodilation. The effect of oxygen on the blood vessels. Higher oxygen will open up the blood vessels. This is totally counterintuitive to what we learned in the muscle section. If I have a bicep, remember, I'm talking about the lungs now, but back when we talked about skeletal muscle, I said, if you have high oxygen in that skeletal muscle, what's it do to the blood vessels? It actually constricts them in the bicep, right? Because you have plenty of oxygen, you just bypass that whole structure. When you're talking about the lungs, it's a little bit different. If you have high oxygen in the lungs, you actually dilate. If you have high oxygen, you dilate. It moves the blood out of the lungs faster because it's high oxygen, right? You're trying to shuttle all the oxygen off to everything else. But if you have low oxygen in the blood vessels in the, in the lungs, you're going to slow down blood flow. Why the heck would you slow down blood flow through the lungs if there's very little oxygen available? So it gives you a chance to pick up more. Do you get it? If there's barely any oxygen in the lungs, do you just want to rush the blood through without picking up oxygen? You're going to slow the blood flow through so that you have more time to pick up the oxygen and carry it away. The only analogy that always pops in my mind is that if you're trying to load a school bus, but you don't want to stop the school bus, right? Do you want that school bus going quickly through all the kids, or do you want it going slowly through all the kids? You want it going slowly so you have plenty of time to load the bus, and then you move it along. If you're going to get more oxygen to the rest of the body, you can strip down the blood vessels in the lungs so that those little red blood cells move what? Faster through the lungs or slower through the lungs? Slower. If they're moving slower through the lungs, can they pick up more or less oxygen? More. The more time you give it exposed to oxygen, the more full the red blood cell will get to carry it away. It's a tough concept that gets a lot of people. So the first thing with this slide is you have to differentiate oxygen or airflow from blood flow. What determines airflow? CO2 levels. What determines the blood flow? The oxygen levels. If you have high CO2, what happens to the bronchioles? They open up to try and get rid of that bad CO2. If you have high oxygen, what happens to the blood vessels? They open up to try and move the blood on to the other tissues that need it.
All right, so here's just an example. If you walk through it, this is looking at both CO2 and oxygen. So an area in which blood flow or perfusion is greater than airflow or ventilation, if you have lots of blood flow and small airflow, you're going to have an increase in CO2. What's that CO2 going to do? Is it going to affect blood or air? It's going to affect your airflow. So it's going to affect the bronchioles, right? If you have high CO2, what should you expect to happen to the bronchioles? They dilate. Yep, so here it shows relaxation of the smooth muscle around the bronchioles. The bronchioles dilate. What's it going to do to that CO2? Help you blow it out. So you increase the airflow, you blow out the CO2, and now you've actually decreased the CO2. What would you expect to happen to that muscle? Now it's going to constrict. The final effect in this reversed the initial stimuli. What kind of feedback loop is that? It's a negative feedback loop. Right. Over here, look at oxygen. So now the oxygen in the area is low. What's the oxygen directly affecting? The airflow or the blood flow? The blood flow. If you have low oxygen in the area, what are you going to do to those blood vessels? If there's barely any oxygen, you're going to constrict them down so it gives you more time to, to do what? Pick up the very little oxygen that's in that area and then push it along. So you constrict the smooth muscle, it squeezes down on the blood vessels, slowing the blood flow through the lungs, you pick up more oxygen and then you shuttle it along. So it decreases blood flow, giving you more time to grab oxygen, so now you have higher oxygen in the blood, and then it reverses that. It's a negative feedback loop again. Always look at the CO2 versus the O2. And remember, the lungs are the exception to the rule. All, all the tissue we talked about before that has skeletal muscle involvement, or any other tissue involvement, if you have a high oxygen in the area, it will constrict the blood vessels, except the lungs. The lungs are the only exception. If you have high oxygen in the area of the lungs, it will actually open the blood flow up, and increase the flow through. It's the exception to the rule. And then this is just the opposite of the last slide. So let's see if you've got it. If CO2 levels are high and oxygen levels are low, what should happen? CO2 levels are high and oxygen is low. So without even looking at the options, if CO2 levels are high, what kind of vessels change? The bronchioles. If CO2 is high, the bronchioles should dilate, right? So high CO2, you want to blow that stuff out, you open up the airway. So in your mind, you should think bronchioles are going to dilate. If oxygen's low, what should happen to the what should happen? Blood vessels should constrict to slow the blood flow down. So you're looking for something that says the bronchioles will open up and the blood vessels will squeeze down, right? So which option is that? Bronchioles will dilate, so it has to be number one or number two. And then the other thing is arterioles will constrict, which is number two. So it's number two. Okay, so gas exchange of O2 and CO2. Sorry, O2 is just oxygen the gas oxygen you can use. And the whole purpose of this is to try and keep in the good oxygen or bring in good oxygen and get rid of the bad CO2. Where are the sites of gas exchange? Capillaries and alveoli, right? So alveoli and capillaries. So you have between the alveoli and the pulmonary capillaries bringing in the good oxygen and getting rid of the bad CO2. Then you carry that good oxygen all the way down to the tissues and you exchange between the tissues and the systemic capillaries. You take the good oxygen out of the, the capillaries, put it into the tissue, take the bad CO2 out of the tissue, put it in the capillaries, and then carry that back up to the lungs, and you just do the same exchange over and over again. You don't need transporters, you don't need pumps. All it is is passive diffusion from high concentration to low in both situations, both gases. So the next concept is that the Air that you breathe is not exactly the same as the air that's in the lungs for a couple reasons. First of all, the air that you breathe, as soon as you breathe it in, it goes over all those mucous membranes. It goes over all that warm capillary that's in like the nasal conch. And what's it doing to the air? It's warming it and adding moisture to it, right? 
That's why when you breathe out, you see moisture in your breath is because you're moisturizing the air when it comes in, and then when you breathe it back out, you're breathing out that moist air. So first it starts getting saturated with water droplets. That's why you see this, the, your breath when you breathe out. So it has a higher concentration of water when it gets into your lungs than it has out here in the air. Especially in the winter time. Out here the air is really dry. You can tell because look at your skin on your hands. It's what? It's dry. You're actually diffusing the water or moisture out of your skin and putting it in the air because it's so dry in the air. So when you breathe in, you have to moisturize that air, bring it down to the lungs so you don't dry out your lungs. And the second thing is that alveolar, and anytime you see a capital P in front of one of these, it means the partial pressure. And so the pressure of the oxygen is reduced since the fresh air you bring in is actually mixed with the stale air that's already in your lungs in your airway. You can't completely exhale all the bad, dirty air and bring in fresh. You breathe out a bunch of the dirty air, but then you bring in some clean stuff with the, with the dirty. It's almost like taking a glass of dirty water and glass of clean water and trying to exchange both of them at the same time. I mean, you could splash them, but what would happen? Would you have a completely clean glass of water here and a clean, completely clean glass of water here? No. You're going to mix them. It just keeps mixing. So every time you breathe in fresh air, you mix it with the old stale air. So those are the two reasons. So at the end of an inspiration, only about 15% of the air you breathe in is actually fresh air. Right. There's that P. What did the P stand for again? Partial pressure. Yeah, when you look at 100% of the pressure out in your atmosphere, your pressure of oxygen is really only about 21%. So the partial pressure of oxygen out here is like 21%. The other 79% is roughly, or roughly 79% is, is nitrogen, which in the gas form is worthless to us. And then CO2 is minimal. It's like a quarter of a percent out in the atmosphere here, even less than that now that I think about it. But there's barely any CO2 out in your environment. All right, so the partial pressure of oxygen is about 100 millimeters of mercury. And it goes from the alveoli into the blood. So what's that telling about the blood? Would the blood be higher than 100 or lower than 100? The blood has to be lower, right? Because this is moving by, by diffusion. It's going to move from high alveoli to the low blood. And then it's constant for two reasons. Because, kind of like I've said before, but a small portion of the total alveolar air is exchanged between each breath. And then the oxygen arriving at the alveoli is, just replaces the old stuff. Let me show you a picture. I'm going to jump ahead. So look in the lungs. There's your, hundred, your partial pressure of 100 millimeters of mercury of oxygen. This is the old dirty blood that's coming back into the lungs, right? The partial pressure of oxygen here is 46, or sorry, 40. Where's the oxygen want to go? 100 down to the 40, until it hits what? Equilibrium. When we were talking about the blood vessels constricting and dilating, if you've got a lot of oxygen here, it's going to open up and just push that on along because you can get a lot of rapid exchange. Let's say we slow this down, we constrict it, and give us time so that it hits 100 here and 100 here. Now we're going to carry that 100 millimeters of mercury of oxygen down into the left side of the heart, out the aorta, over to the bicep, or whatever tissue. I use bicep as a generic tissue. But it goes to the bicep. Once it gets into the bicep tissue, the bicep's always burning oxygen. So the bicep muscles, or the tissue muscle, is always going to be low in oxygen. So if I have 100 parts oxygen here, and I only have 40 parts oxygen here, where's the oxygen want to go? Yeah, from the systemic capillaries, from the blood, down into the muscle cell. And then, now we're going to flip this around. It's hit equilibrium, now we're down at 40 in both areas, but we're making lots of CO2. So if the CO2 is really high here, what's it want to do? It wants to diffuse to where there's only 40 parts of CO2 until it hits what? equilibrium. So now I have 46 parts of CO2 in the cell and in the blood. The 46 parts of CO2 come up the vena cava into the right heart, from the right heart out into the pulmonary circulation, into the lungs. Now I have 46 parts of CO2. I only have 40 parts of CO2 in the lungs. Where's the CO2 want to go? From 46 where it's high to the 40 where it's low. And then the atmosphere has like no CO2 practically. Look at that. It's 0.03 millimeters of mercury. So where's the CO2 want to go? Out to the atmosphere. So it's going to blow out. It's going to blow out really rapidly. You easily lose CO2 because look at the concentration gradient. 40 down to 0 
oxygen in the atmosphere is 160, and in your lungs it's only 100, there's a definitely a concentration gradient, but it's not as steep. So is it easier for you to get rid of CO2 or to get in oxygen? It's easier to get rid of CO2, it's a little harder to get in oxygen. And if I go up to the Rocky Mountains where this drops to maybe like 130, what's that tell you? It's going to be even harder to get the oxygen diffused in your lungs. All right, so that's what these last two slides were talking about. Look at the concentration gradients. When you bring in oxygen to the lungs, the lung oxygen is always higher than the blood. So it goes into the blood. When that blood gets down to the tissues, the blood oxygen is always higher than the tissue, so it goes into the tissue. And then that's where there's high CO2. So the high CO2 in the tissue, because you're burning the oxygen, will go into the blood. It carries all the way back up to the heart, high CO2, into the lungs, and then you blow it out into the lungs and into the atmosphere. And that's all these two slides are saying. Just follow the concentration gradients of each of those substances. So oxygen moves by diffusion into metabolically active tissues because of what? Why does it move into the metabolically active tissues? So oxygen moves by diffusion. By the way, diffusion is kind of the key there. What are you looking for? Diffusion is telling you it's going from where to where? High to low. So if it moves by diffusion into the metabolically active tissue, what's that tell you the tissue has to be? High or low? It has to be low. It says the oxygen content is higher than the tissue, or in the tissue than the blood. Would that be right? If the tissue is high oxygen and the blood is low, where does it want to go? Out to the blood. That one's wrong. How about oxygen content is lower in the tissue than the blood? Yeah, if the oxygen content is high in the blood, low in the tissue, you know it's automatically going to move in. If the oxygen content is the same, does oxygen want to move? No, so three is absolutely wrong too. Has to be number two. Always moves high to low. All right, other factors that affect the rate of gas transfer, how fast it moves. Whose laws are these, by the way? They're fixed. They're part of those laws of diffusion. So if you, without looking at the slide, if you increase the surface area of the lungs, will you increase or decrease the rate of diffusion of oxygen? You increase it, right? So if you have a big surface area in the lungs, you're going to diffuse oxygen better. If you have a small surface area, it's harder to diffuse oxygen. How about the thickness of the membrane? Here you have an alveolar wall. Here you have a capillary wall. If I bring these two walls further apart, what's going to happen to my rate of oxygen movement? It slows. Imagine you have pulmonary edema, and in between the capillaries and the alveoli, you have more and more water. What's that happening to your rate of diffusion? Slows it. Pulmonary, pulmonary uh, edema slows the rate of diffusion. If you have scar tissue in there building up, what's it going to do to the rate of diffusion? Slow it. Anything that puts more substance in between the blood vessels and the alveoli is going to slow diffusion. What about even if the distance between the alveoli and the blood vessels are the same, but over here you put a lot of mucus. So you have oxygen, mucus, alveolar wall, blood vessel wall. What's going to happen to the rate of exchange? It also slows. So if you look at something like cystic fibro... Or, uh, what am I looking for? Yeah, actually cystic fibrosis would be a really good example. With cystic fibrosis, they have extra mucus in the lungs. What's going to happen to the rate of oxygen exchange? It goes down. It's harder for them to exchange oxygen. I was thinking bronchitis would also do the same thing because they have more mucus in the airways. All right, gas transport. So oxygen transport, how it moves. This is actually really important. How do you already know that oxygen moves through your blood? By attaching to what? Hemoglobin. 98% of it attaches to the hemoglobin. A little bit of it dissolves in water. It's hard to get oxygen dissolved into water. It doesn't want to do it very easily. So the plasma, the water, and the blood, only about 1.5% of the oxygen in your blood is actually dissolved in that plasma. And then the second thing is carbon dioxide transport is not the same as oxygen transport. Carbon dioxide binding to hemoglobin is only about 30%. One third of the CO2 in your blood is actually stuck to the hemoglobin. It actually binds to the, the protein molecule and not the heme. Oxygen binds to the heme, CO2 binds to the protein, the globin, hemoglobin. They don't bind to the same place. What primarily carries CO2 through your body is this stuff called bicarbonate. 
bicarbonate. You might want to put a star by that word. This isn't the last time this semester you'll see it. In fact, you're going to see it a lot for the rest of the semester. When you carry CO2 through your body, you primarily carry as bicarbonate. Carbonate. It's a slightly basic material. What's interesting is that if you have sodium bicarbonate in your kitchen, you know what that is? It's baking soda. You add some water to that and you turn it into this CO2 gas. Your body does kind of the reverse of that. It takes the CO2 gas and then turns it into bicarbonate so they can transport it safely. And then the physically dissolved in the water is about 10%. So CO2 actually dissolves in water better than oxygen does, but it's still a low percentage. So if I ever asked you a question like, how is, how is uh, oxygen primarily transported through your blood, what would you say? It sticks to hemoglobin. If I asked you, how is carbon dioxide primarily transported through your blood, would you say sticks to hemoglobin? No, it's as bicarbonate. So it's turned into this new chemical called bi bicarbonate and transported. All right, so when we talk about terms like reduced hemoglobin, this is a chemistry term. If it's reduced hemoglobin, that means that the oxygen has been removed. So if it's reduced, that means that oxygen has, oxygen has been re removed. If you've taken chemistry, it's that whole Leo goes Ger. So oxygen's been removed. If it's oxidized hemoglobin, that means oxygen's added. So we call it oxyhemoglobin. When you have reduced hemoglobin, guess what kind of color that iron turns? So if you remember listening to the, the blood lectures, when you have iron on a car and it's oxidized, what color does it turn? Orange. Right, I'm glad you remember that color. It's like this reddish orange. It's kind of like glowy red color almost. That's oxidized. But when it's deoxidized, it turns more of a, like a bluey purple color. And I don't know if, I don't remember if I said, I used to work on Volkswagens. And what's kind of cool is when I would sand off the paint on a Volkswagen, you could spray the stuff that deoxidized it. And what color would it turn it? Would it turn it a reddish orange color or would it turn it a blue color? It turned the iron in the car blue. It was kind of cool because it was deoxidizing it and preventing it from rusting. If I let it rust by having water exposed to it, it would turn that reddish orange color, that rusty color. So a couple terms and just keep in mind what color they turn. Because if the blood is turning blue, that means it's what? A lot of reduced or a lot of oxidized. If it's turning blue, it's reduced. If it's bright red, it's oxidized. The next term is hemoglobin saturation. When you saturate a sponge with water, what that, what's that tell you? Does it have barely any water in it? It means that it's completely filled with water. If you saturate a hemoglobin, a hemoglobin has four heme molecules, right? So how many pieces of oxygen can it bind? Four. Four different pieces of oxygen. If you've saturated that hemoglobin, that means you have all four of those oxygen binding sites are filled. So here's how, we'll say that this is one hemoglobin molecule moving through. And there you have four possible binding sites. As it comes up to the lungs, what's kind of cool about your body is your body is smart. It's figured out that instead of putting work into moving oxygen from the lungs into the blood, it can just use diffusion. So it brings this hemoglobin up here to the lungs, it pulls an oxygen from the lungs to the blood, and then from the blood to the hemoglobin. Two-step process. It goes from high concentration lung, low concentration blood, which is all the substance around, and then from the low concentration blood into the lower concentration hemoglobin. So it's going from high to low, and what has it hit here? Where there are two particles here and two particles in the environment. Yeah, it's, it's gone down to where it's at equilibrium. If Look how many particles I'm carrying here. If I'm carrying all this on hemoglobin, I can safely shuttle it away. I can keep moving oxygen in over and over and over until I completely fill these up like this. So by binding it to the hemoglobin, I can move this particle to here and then move it over to here. Now I can move another particle to here and then move that one over to here. And I can keep shuffling them until I've maximized my oxygen in my blood by saturating or completely saturating this. If I didn't have hemoglobin, I could equilibrate my lungs to my blood, but I wouldn't carry as much of this oxygen. Your body's maximized its oxygen carrying ability by making this hemoglobin particle. So 
I have barely any pure oxygen left in my lungs, it's almost all bound in hemoglobin, and then I shuttle that off to my biceps or my liver or whatever organ. That's saturation. So in other words, people with anemia are more of this situation. What's their problem? They're not carrying oxygen very well at all. They need to build some more hemoglobin so they can carry more oxygen. Ferritin's, ferritin's the storage form of iron in your body. The little FE is telling you it's iron at the beginning. So if you're not getting enough iron, then you can't effectively build things like red blood cells. And that's why they test for ferritin levels. Yeah. So if you don't have, if you don't have barely any ferritin, then they know that it's that specific type of anemia. Yeah, because there are lots of types of anemia. So iron deficiency anemia is one of them, and it usually happens to women because they bleed a lot and lose a lot of the iron. It could also happen to people that have a, a little, uh, like a diet restriction. Like if you don't eat very much meat, it's hard to get iron into your body. A lot of runners, my husband, my team has anemia from just running a lot. You can lose it through running. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By burning it up and... They actually said your uh, emphasis of like foot being pavement, they found like blood loss can occur somehow first like something with blood loss. I don't know. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. Did you eat a lot of bruising on your feet? All right, percent hemoglobin. So if you're not com if you're completely saturated, it's 100 percent. If you're not completely saturated, then you can go, you know, 90 percent, 95 percent, 80 percent. When you take a, when you take the hematocrits or you take a pulse ox, that's telling you the percent of the hemoglobin is bound. If you had somebody that had like 95 percent bound hemoglobin, what color do you expect their skin to be? So almost all of their hemoglobin is bound to oxygen. It'd be red. But what if they had really low, like 50% or even lower, which, by the way, is pretty much fatal. What color would you expect their skin to be? More of a bluish color, cyanosis. Yeah. And those little pull socks things that they just clip on the finger, that's all they're doing. They're shining light through their finger. And when it's oxygenated hemoglobin, it, bounds, it bounces light differently. So like the red bounces differently than the blue light does. And they can determine that. Cool, a chemistry equation. Anyway, law of mass action. If you've taken chemistry, this is actually called Le Chatelier's principle. So you've probably seen it before. But it says that if you have any kind of a chemical equation, you put an equal sign here, that if you start adding to this side, it will start turning into that side so that they both balance out. If you start taking away from this side, it'll start taking away from this side so they both balance out. No matter what you do to one side of the equation, it will balance out back and forth. So in other words, if I... Okay. It's unfortunate that that's during my class that you have to wake up. Anyway, so the law of mass action is shifting it back and forth. <laughs> I've been listening to this guy for 45 minutes. <laughs> you know, to wake up. I would figured it would be louder than that, though, to wake, wake you up from the coma that I put you in. Anyway, so as we start adding more hemoglobin and oxygen, we're going to get more bound oxyhemoglobin. If you have less hemoglobin, even if you have oxygen, you're not going to be able to bind this, right? So if I have less hemoglobin and anemia, or I have less oxygen, like up in Colorado in the Rocky Mountains, I'm going to have less oxyhemoglobin. It's, it seems like common sense, and again, a lot of these laws are common sense. Right? So when we saturate or we try and fill up your oxygen levels in your blood, we refer to it as the saturation curve. So, of course, the common sense gets graphed. Right? This is kind of a cool, instead of being direct, like if I had one piece of hemoglobin and I directly bind them to four pieces of oxygen, if I add 10 pieces of hemoglobin and 40 pieces of oxygen, you'd think that it would just go directly proportionate, but it doesn't. This is kind of weird. They call it an S-shaped curve. So at first, what will happen is if you bring deoxygenated blood to your lungs, that oxygenated or that deoxygenated blood will get oxygenated really, really, really quickly, but then it will start topping off and slowing down its oxygen oxygenation. So even though you have empty seats in the red blood cells where oxygen could get on, it doesn't fill up that fast. It's and I always think of it like empty seats on a bus again. I think of when you were on a field trip as a kid, and they pull up that empty bus. What part of the line moves the fastest? The beginning of the line or the very end? You have a completely empty bus, right? The beginning of the line 
the kids go on and they fill up the seats really quick, but why is the end of the line so slow? Because the last kids getting on the bus, as they're getting on, they're looking for an empty seat and it's hard to find because there's the seat next to the kid that picks his nose. There's the seat next to the girl that smells funny. You know, there's always that. You're like, oh, where am I going to go? Oxygen does the same thing. When it goes into a red blood cell, you've got 250 million hemoglobin. But in the very beginning, there are 250 million empty hemoglobin. At the end, if you only have 200 million, you've got to sort through and try and find those empty seats, right? So is it going to fill up as fast at the end? It doesn't fill up as fast. So in the beginning, it goes really rapidly. Quick, 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 quick. And then at the end, as the blood's starting to leave the lungs, most of the seats are already filled, so it's really hard to fill the last seats. And that's what this whole curve's trying to tell you, is that in the beginning of oxygen saturation, it goes fast. But at the end, it's really hard to do. It's hard to get the last pieces of oxygen into your blood. All right, some factors that can change this curve, so some things that make it go faster or slower, we refer to shifting the curve to the right or to the left. So factors that shift the curve to the right that actually slow oxygen binding. It makes it harder for the oxygen to bind. So when you shift this curve to the right, you're shifting it over into this hard to bind region. It's like taking all this line and just moving it over here where it's really hard to get things to stick to oxygen. That's what shifting it to the right means, or to hemoglobin, oxygen to hemoglobin. The first three factors, I always think of exercise. If I'm exercising a muscle, I increase the CO2. I increase the what? What's this H plus representing? <coughs> acids, right? If I exercise, what am I building up in the muscle? Lactic acid is a really good example. And if I'm exercising that muscle, what happens to its temperature? It gets hotter, right? All three of these, I have higher CO2, I have more acids, and I have a higher temperature are all related to exercise, right, and the muscle. I use exercise again because of the bicep example, but the same thing with the kidney. If the kidney's working harder, it's making more heat, it's building up more acids, it's making more CO2, it's going to actually increase the rate of oxygen going into the kidney and the less oxygen binding. So let me say that again. If I go to a muscle, do I want the muscle, the blood going through the muscle, do I want that to hold on to its oxygen or do I want it to let go of its oxygen? Blood flows through an exercising muscle do you want the blood to hold on to its oxygen or do you want it to let go of the oxygen and go into the muscle? You want it to let go. These are factors that prevent oxygen from binding to the hemoglobin. Does that make sense? The more of this you have, the faster the oxygen lets go of the hemoglobin. The slower it binds back to the hemoglobin. Hotter temperatures, increased acid, and increased CO2 make the oxygen jump off of the hemoglobin. So whatever tissue it's in at that time, it'll move into that tissue efficiently. Hot muscles, you want the oxygen going into the hot muscle. If it's an acidic muscle, you want the oxygen flowing into the acidic muscle. If it's a high CO2 muscle, you want the oxygen flowing into the muscle. You want it letting go of the hemoglobin. You shift the curve to the right. This last one's really interesting because there are lots of different studies. It's actually a chemical in your body that will make your oxygen leave your blood. Most common place you see this is actually in the placenta. Why would you want this stuff high in the placenta? Because you want oxygen to leave mom's blood and go into the placenta so it goes where? To the baby, right? So it's stripping as many molecules of oxygen out of mom's blood so it can go into to the baby. Some muscles that are well-toned muscles actually increase the amounts of this so that they can easily get oxygen too. But the most common place you're going to hear about is actually in the placenta. And I think your notes may say 2,3-bi-phosphoglycerate. There's no difference between bi and di. They both mean two of those phosphate molecules. So all of these are going to make oxygen leave the hemoglobin. And it's going to shift the curve to the right. So it's slow to bind to hemoglobin and faster to leave. This next one's tricky. Factors that shift the curve to the left, there's only one you have to know, and it's carbon monoxide. You might want to put a little underline under the mono, because the stuff that you blow out is carbon dioxide, right? Carbon monoxide is a carbon molecule with one oxygen stuck to it. Carbon dioxide is a carbon molecule with two oxygens stuck to it. So its shape looks more like water. Carbon monoxide looks more like oxygen, where it's two atoms stuck together. 
oxygen is O2, oxygen, oxygen. Carbon monoxide is carbon with an oxygen. This is why I'm pointing that out, is because carbon monoxide looks like oxygen, it binds to heme and prevents the oxygen from binding in the first place. What's really sucky about this is that carbon monoxide loves that little heme molecule 250 times more than oxygen does. If you love chocolate cake 250 times more than me, and we see a piece of chocolate cake on the other side of the room, who's going to win? You, right? You're going to knock my ass down. You're going to step on my face. You're going to do whatever it takes to get to that, mon that, that chocolate. That's what carbon monoxide does. It fights really hard to get into the heme, binds to the heme, and it won't let go. It loves the heme. It's not going to share it. So what's bad about that is that when that binds, it doesn't unbind. The only way to get rid of it is to destroy that red blood cell. So people that have carbon monoxide poisoning, as soon as they leave the house and get fresh air, are they fixed? No. You're just keeping more carbon monoxide from binding until they get a chance to kill off those red blood cells and then build brand new ones. Does that happen overnight? No, that happens over several days, right? So it's going to take them usually days to recover from that carbon monoxide poisoning. All right, so it shifts the curve to the left, which prevents oxygen from binding in the first place. So if I asked a question like this, which factor shifts the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve to the right? So what analogy did I tell you? When you shift the curve to the right, what should you think right away? Exercise, right? So do you associate exercise with cold temperature? Nope, you associate with warm. Get rid of that one. Do you associate exercise with carbon monoxide? No. In fact, that would shift the curve where? To the left. Do you associate exercise with acids? Yes. Yes, you build up lactic acids, right? Do you associate it with increased CO2? Yes. What did I say wrong about number three? You increase, it, you increase the acids, right? Why is number three wrong? Because it's saying low acid, so you know number three is not right. But you do associate exercise with increased CO2. So that one's our right answer, number four. I try to give you little things that help you remember a little bit better. You have to know this equation. Sorry. I know, black. And it was in the blood lectures too. It's going to come back again when we talked about acids and bases. This is a common equation. All right, so when you attack or look at any of these kind of equations that are chemical reaction, these arrows mean that it's reversible. It can go in this direction, but it can also go back in this direction. Same thing's over here. The CA is an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. And what it does is it converts CO2 plus H2O into something called carbonic acid. So it takes these two things and turns them into carbonic acid. Over here, carbonic acid it likes to quickly dissociate. It's a weak acid. It just falls apart. So it falls apart into acid and um, bicarbonate, which you might want to write underneath this. This is bicarbonate's chemical formula. Why was bicarbonate so important? Because it's the major carrying form of CO2. So you already saw these. Carbon dioxide transport physically dissolved 10%, bound to hemoglobin 30%, but that bicarbonate is 60%. There's the chemical formula for bicarbonate. Whenever you see this, and this helped me get through chemistry, whenever you see a chemical equation, I always imagine it's like a bathtub. So I draw like this little bathtub shape underneath it. But the bathtub has a faucet on this end, faucet on that end, and a drain on both ends. The reason I say that is if I start adding substance to this side, it's, what's going to happen to the level of the bathtub? Does it all just pile up over here? Nope, it trickles over to this side and then this side so that it's all even across. That's the law of mass action, right? It distributes it evenly, Le Chatelier's principle. As I add to this side, it evenly distributes across. As I add carbon dioxide and, and water, it turns into bi er, sorry, carbonic acid, which just associates into bicarbonate and acids. If I pull the plug on this side, does the water just drain from here? Nope, it drains from here, but it pulls this over here and it pulls that over here so that all these levels are exactly the same. Why this is important is because when you're looking at organs that control this equation, what organ in your body do you think is going to be the primary controller that's going to add CO2 or drain CO2 from your body? 
the lungs. So my faucet, actually my faucet or my plug over on this side, is going to be the lungs. The primary organ that's going to help you remove acids and bases from your body are going to be your kidneys. And this is kind of foreshadowing because when we talk about the kidneys, this equation is going to pop up again. So if I start accumulating CO2, let's say, let's say I'm hypoventilating, I'm not breathing very well, what's going to happen to my CO2 levels in my body? They accumulate. Are they going to just stay as high CO2? No. They're going to start turning into carbonic acid. And what did I tell you? If you accumulate CO2, common sense should tell you you're going to accumulate acids. So it turns into carbonic acid, which turns into a free acid, which is really dangerous. This goes to the kidney. And guess what the kidney is going to have to do because you're not breathing properly? It's going to make you pee out acids. So interesting fun fact is that if you were breathing slowly later that day, if you measured the acidity of your pee, it would become more what? Acidic. Yeah, it would be more acidic. It helps regulate your CO2 levels. Another interesting thing is that let's say that you have diabetic ketone acidosis. What's your problem? You have high acids. You have lots of these acids. So you're adding acids to this side of the bathtub. bathtub. It's going to shift over here, and it's going to start producing more CO2. What happens to your breathing because you're making more acid? You start breathing heavier. You pull the drain over here and you're dumping CO2 out of your body, which lowers the acid on this side, fixing it. It's a cool way that your body manipulates this equation with a couple of organs, right? So high acid will shift everything this way, making more CO2, and you just blow that out to lower acid effectively. If you had low acids, which is also dangerous, what might your breathing start doing? If you had low acid in your body, which means you're going into a state of alkalosis, which is just as dangerous as acidosis, what would your lungs start doing? Blow more CO2 out or keep more CO2 in? Keep more CO2 in, retaining the CO2 would come over here and make more acids to bring you back up to normal. That's the importance of CO2. Like I said before, people are like, CO2 is bad. Is CO2 bad? No, it's important. You need CO2. If you don't have enough, it can be fatal. If you have too much, it can also be fatal. So this is a red blood cell looking at the side. There you see the biconcave structure. Here at the tissue, you make CO2. It comes out and dissolves. 10% of it's going to dissolve into your blood. Another 30% is going to come in and bind to what? What's the HB represent? Hemoglobin. Yep, so 30% binds to the hemoglobin, and then the remaining 60% turns into what? Bicarbonate. They're all listed right here. So this bicarbonate goes through this equation, CO2 plus water, carbonic anhydrase, to make carbonic acid. That turns into acid and bicarbonate. The acid will stick to the remaining hemoglobin to neutralize it, to keep it safe. But now you have that base, that alkaline substance. It's going to get shifted out into your plasma to help neutralize acids out in the plasma. Right, so that bicarbonate is going to leave the red blood cell. The plasma, the red blood cell is going to travel up to the lungs, and then all of these reactions go in reverse. The bicarbonate comes back in, turns back into CO2, goes out to the lungs, and you blow it out. The hemoglobin lets go of the CO2, goes out to the lungs, and you blow it out. So the dissolved CO2 goes into the lungs, and you blow it out. It's a reversible equation. At the tissue, it, all that CO2 comes into the red blood cell and does its chemical reaction. At the lungs, it leaves the red blood cell and then leaves through the lungs. So I kind of showed you in the picture, but at the systemic capillaries, what's going to happen? Will CO2 go in to the tissue or will CO2 go into the blood at the systemic capillaries? Not your lungs, the systemic capillaries. Where does CO2 go? Does it go into your tissue or does it come out of the tissue and go into the lungs? Or uh, lungs, to blood. Into the blood because the blood's going to carry it to what organ? the lung to shuttle it away. So increasing CO2 at the tissue drives the reaction to the right side, like this, moves it to the right, means that it's going to go into the red blood cell and get carried up to the lungs. So at the systemic capillary, it pushes it into acid and bicarbonate and then gets carried up to the lungs where it goes backwards. So at the pulmonary capillaries, it goes backwards. It shifts the equation to the left. When it shifts it to the left, it's going to take that CO2, or bicarbonate, turn it into CO2, and then blow it out of the lungs. It's kind of a complex process, but every breath that you take, this happens. 
right? The chloride shift was one little piece that I left out of the, the picture. Remember how I said the bicarbonate has to leave the red blood cell? Well, the bicarbonate has a charge on it. This is still a cell. If you take a negative charge out of the cell, what happens to the inside of the cell? It becomes more negative, which starts changing its electricity. You don't want that in a red blood cell. Maybe in a neuron that would be good, but not in a red blood cell. So by taking the bicarbonate, which has a negative charge, and moving it out, I will move chloride that has a negative charge in. What did I do to the electricity? I took one negative out, I put one negative in. How did the electricity change? Not at all, right? It stayed electrically neutral. That's called the chloride shift. When you bring the bicarbonate out of the, the cell, you have to bring the chloride in so that it keeps the cell electrically neutral. When you get to the lungs and you bring the bicarbonate back into the cell, what do you think you do with chloride? You move it out of the cell to keep it electrically neutral. It's called the chloride shift. And then there you can see it. So chloride shifts in at the tissues, and then later when you get to the lungs, it shifts back out. And then the Bohr effect and the Halley effect. This is these are two guys, two scientists that basically they must have hated each other because they said exactly the same thing, but from two perspectives, like a married couple, right? No, you're wrong because I'm right. But they're the same. They're the same thing. This guy Bohr said that if you increase the CO2 and the acid in the blood, you decrease the oxygen. Okay? So you're going to dump the oxygen, you're going to increase it going into the muscle. In other words, you're shifting the curve to the right is what this guy is saying. Here, this guy goes, no, you're wrong. If you take the oxygen off of the cell and you put it into the muscle, then it increases the ability to pick up hemoglobin and carbon dioxide. In other words, he's still saying you shift it to the right. They're saying the exact same thing, except one saying that it's moving because of the acid and the carbon dioxide, and the other one's going, no, it's moving because of the oxygen. Who cares? If you understand the concept that when you increase carbon dioxide and acid, does the oxygen want to stay bound to the hemoglobin? If you increase the carbon dioxide and acid during exercise, does the oxygen want to stay bound to the hemoglobin, or does it want to move into the muscle? It wants to let go and move into the muscle. It doesn't matter how you word it, that's exactly what happens. It shifts the curve to the right. So two guys saying the same thing, just saying it the opposite of each other. So which is not an important step of carbon dioxide transport? Which is not an important step in carbon dioxide transport. So think about that equation. Number one, does carbon dioxide mix with water to form bicarbonate and acid? Look at the left side of the equation. and Look down in your notes at the left side of the equation. Does water and carbon dioxide mix? That's what the plus says, right? Does it become bicarbonate and acid? Yes. That one looks true. The only thing missing is what? That thing in the middle, right? That carbonic acid. So number one is true. How about number two? Carbonic anhydrase converts CO2 and water into carbonic acid. Is that true so far? Yes, that little CA is carbonic anhydrase, which disassociates into acid and that HCO3 negative stuff. That looks pretty true. That's actually the whole equation written out in words. right? What's the HCO3 negative? That's the bicarbonate. So it's just saying acid and bicarbonate. So that one looks pretty true. How about number three? Bicarbonate leaves red blood cells to buffer acids. Bicarbonate was a base. What's a base like to do? It likes to buffer an acid. So it leaves. And then how about number four? Calcium comes into the red blood cell to make the red blood cell electrically neutral. True or false? Why is it false? It should be chloride. What's that called? The chloride shift. Yeah, number four is wrong because it should be chloride. All right, winding down. Control of respiration. You should automatically know where's the primary controller in the brain for breathing. Keeping you alive, your basic life function. Medulla oblongata. So you have two respiratory groups. You have the primary one that's the medulla or medullary, medulla oblongata, respiratory group. This is the one that controls your basic breathing. So you have the DRG, dorsal respiratory group, that allows inspiration to happen. 
When this fires, it sends a signal down the phrenic nerve and tells your diaphragm to contract. It makes you breathe. You have the ventral respiratory group that's stimulated when there's an increased demand for ventilation. So let's say you want to uh, exercise. You start exercising harder, you're going to have to breathe harder just to keep up with it. And then this last one, the pre botzinger complex, generates a respiratory rhythm or a pacemaker so that you automatically fire, 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 fire. So in case you forget to breathe, this thing keeps going. What kind of muscles are these controlling? Smooth, cardiac, or skeletal? This is tricky. Skeletal. These are controlling, this is a pacemaker that's actually controlling a skeletal muscle. The pacemaker is a neuron though, it's not a muscle. So you've got this pacemaker and the neurons in this part of the brain that tells your muscles contract, 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 contract. And then the pons, you might want to write fine tuning. Remember this is basic up here, medullary is the basic, just your primitive ability to breathe. The pons fine tunes breathing. And it has two centers, one called apneustic and one's called pneumotaxic. Basically what these two centers are doing is one is preventing you from over inhaling so you don't blow out your lungs. When you're exercising real hard and you're breathing as hard as you possibly can, if you were to breathe any harder, you would actually rip your lungs. That would be a bad thing. So these prevent you from over inflating your lungs. What they do is they shut off these other centers. These are inspiratory centers that make you breathe. These will shut them off. And they also prevent abnormal breathing. Your medulla oblongata, if it had control of your breathing, you would breathe like this. <laughs> that's what your breathing will be like. It's called Shane Stokes respirations. That's a sign that what organ's broken. If you start breathing like that, what's broken? The medulla or the pons? The pons. If you have intracranial pressure, your brain is swelling and it smashes the pons, you start breathing like that. That's a sign that you better get your ass to the hospital and they're going to cut a part of your skull off so that your brain can start swelling up. It's a sign that your pons is, is in bad shape. If you took a nail gun right to the medulla oblongata, how would you breathe? <coughs> Not at all. There's no fine tuning dead, right? If, you, if, if your whole brain were perfect intact but something hit the medulla oblongata and shut it off, your, your heart rate would actually go up, but your breathing would completely stop. And your heart rate would go, did, 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 did. stop, right? So it would be the end. Moral of the story is if you're ever working with nail guns, wear some kind of protective brace around your medulla oblongata. Because you could shoot yourself up here and live through that, but you shoot back here and you're gone. I feel like Cousin Eddie in Christmas Vacation, you know? <laughs> Since they put that plate in my head, Clark, uh, Catherine turns on the microwave, piss my pants, and forget who I am for about an hour or so. It's a good thing it wasn't the medulla oblongata. All right. So anyway, both influence, this is pertaining to the pons, both influence output of the medullary respiratory centers, and they fine-tune the breathing. So if you were to map these out, of course, the pons is up here, medulla is down here. Here are your primary breathing centers that just control the ability to breathe. By the way, the primary controller of breathing in the medulla oblongata is acid, but what directly controls the acid levels? CO2. So the big moral of the story is if you go and be on this class and you get more specific into respiration, it's acid that's accumulating in the brain that actually drives breathing, but it's because of the CO2s in the brain that the acid rises. Does it have anything to do with oxygen? None. Nothing, your brain doesn't give a damn about the oxygen level in the medulla oblongata. It's more concerned with the CO2 and the acids. Right? And then up here, this is just fine tuning what's going on down here. So if you actually trace the pathway, I thought I had it. You have the medulla, when it fires, it sends a signal down the phrenic nerve and then makes the diaphragm contract. When you're ready to stop breathing, the pons will tell it, stop doing that. And then it just relaxes the diaphragm and you exhale. And then medulla fires again, increasing the size of the lungs, breathing air in, and then when you're ready to shut it off, the pond says stop that, and then cause it to relax over and over and over again. All right, so there were the two sets of nerves. Again, the phrenic nerve and the intercostal nerves, and the intercostal nerves are causing the external intercostals to contract. That's for inspiration, right? So I think we covered those.
right? Herring Brewery Reflex, this is all about exercise. And like I said before, if you were if you were exercising really hard and your lungs want to expand, what would happen if they overexpanded? The alveoli would start tearing, and that's not a good thing. Because when the alveoli tear, they don't repair very easily. Right, so what it does is it prevents the tidal volume from expanding over one liter. So you can double your tidal volume, your average tidal volume, before your lungs start ripping. So inside your chest you have pulmonary stretch receptors so that when they get to a certain extent, they send a signal up to the medulla oblongata and say do what? Fire more or fire less? Fire less. When the stretch gets so big, it sends a signal up to the medulla oblongata and says stop firing then suddenly your diaphragm relaxes and you exhale. You can't overexpand your lungs. If you hooked an oxygen hose directly into your nose, plug your mouth and plug your nose, then you can overexpand it, but that has nothing to do with your brain. If you have a dramatic change in pressure, that could change your lungs and actually cause them to pop, which is always a fun story. Did I, have I said this before about the bats? So what was interesting is when they first started putting those big wind turbines up, I remember I was going to Iowa State in Nevada it still seems weird to say Nevada, but anyway, Nevada had this huge farm, and there were people bitching about how it was scaring their cattle and their sheep and stuff, and it was killing them because they were stressing out. That was crap. Total crap. It was just people resistant to change. But what they did find is there were a higher number of birds and bats that were dead underneath these things. What do you think happened to the birds? It started getting dark. They were flying too high, and they'd fly right into it, right? Boink. So you'd find these birds with big hematomas on their, their skull, you know? And they were dead for that. But the bats laying on the ground, their, out, their superficial markings just fine. There was nothing wrong with them on the outside. Bats are smart. Bats see well in the dark, so it didn't matter how dark it got. Bats predicted this turbine swinging around, right? So they're smart. They're flying up to it. They fly around it, but they don't understand physics. This side's high pressure. This side's low pressure. When they fly around it, suddenly their lungs go, <laughs> and their lungs would explode. Yep, so it's the end right away. But I, like I just said, the pulmonary stretch receptors are for your ability to control that. They send a signal, an afferent neuron that goes towards the central nervous system up to the medulla. They shut off the medulla, which stops your inhale, which automatically causes you to exhale. So if I asked you a question like this, which control center in the brainstem is involved with fine-tuning respirations? Which control center in the brainstem is involved with fine-tuning respiration? So in other words, it's asking you for what structure, the medulla or the pons? The pons, and which was the only one that was in the pons? Number four, yep, apneustic. Pneumotaxic and the apneustic. Just remember that neuro word and you know it's in the pons. It's referring to the breathing. Right. And then the chemoreceptors, of course, everything is detected by a receptor, otherwise your body doesn't know it exists. You have peripheral and central. The peripheral are in the aortic arch and the carotid sinus. The same place we talked about what type of receptors? Baroreceptors, same place. So that they can measure the oxygen slash CO2 content coming out of the, out of the uh, heart and into the body, the brain and then the system. Central chemoreceptors are in the brain stem. Peripheral ones, aortic arch, and the carotid sinus, and the central ones are in the brain stem. Medulla oblongata. So here you can see the carotid bodies are detecting the oxygen CO2 concentration going to the brain, and then the aortic bodies are in the aortic arch that are going to the rest of the system. So chemical regulation, uh, one at a time. So signals that increase ventilation. First, if you have a low oxygen concentration in arterial blood, that stimulates a peripheral chemoceptor. So decreased oxygen in the arterial blood stimulates a peripheral chemoreceptor. By the way, this doesn't help you very much. These are really, really weak. Your, your oxygen concentration has to drop down below 50% and actually closer to like 30% before these start tripping on. So at the time that these start turning on, you're already passed out. If you were in a house with a lot of CO2, at the point where you've fallen asleep, then these will start turning on, and at that point you're asleep, you're not waking up, and then you die in your sleep. So these are only in extreme situations. 
Next, increased arterial CO2 strongly stimulates the central chemoceptors. And then the last one, an increase in hydrogen in the arterial blood stimulates peripheral chemoreceptors. And in reality, hydrogen is also a key player in central. So you might want to actually add that, peripheral and central. Right. So you can see a change in CO2. As it's changing, it's going to affect peripheral chemoreceptors and central chemoreceptors that stimulate the medullary respiratory group, increasing ventilation, increasing your ability to get rid of the CO2 and drop those levels back down. Don't need all the pictures. Last, I think this is the last question. Yep, I think it's the last question. There's one more slide, but this is the last question. So an increase in 2,3-D, or sorry, D, diphosphoglycerate, You'll see either DPG or BPG, di or bi is the same thing again. Would stimulate which chemoreceptor then? So an increase in 2,3 diphosphoglycerate would stimulate which chemoreceptor? How many people think it's the peripheral one? How many people think it's the central one? How many think it doesn't affect either? I'm glad that the only hands that went up were for number three because that's the right answer. Remember, back here, we talked about peripheral chemoreceptors being affected by acids and oxygen, central by acids and CO2. The only time we talked about 2,3-BPG was back when we talked about oxygen binding and unbinding. That was talking about dissociation curves. Right, and then the last thing, exercise profoundly increases ventilation, but the mechanisms are, are not completely clear. So we do know some things. When you start moving your joints, you breathe heavier which is interesting. So all you have to do is sit on the couch and go, squawk, squawk, and you start breathing heavier. I think you have to make that sound too. And then number two, increase in body temperature. As soon as your body temperature goes up, you start breathing heavier. Why? This should actually make sense. When the body temperature goes up, what happens to your ability to bind oxygen to hemoglobin? It goes down. So you actually have to get more hemoglobin through, going through your lungs to be able to bind it. And you learned that when we talked about dissociation curves. Number three, epinephrine released from adrenal medulla goes through your body, and that causes you to start breathing heavier. Go figure. What's epinephrine associated with? Fight or flight. When you're running for your life, what do you do? Breathe less or breathe more? Breathe more. So common sense tells you it should have some effect on it. And then impulses from the cerebral cortex, you can consciously think to breathe heavier. <laughs> Hyperventilating, right? So you get a little bit anxious, you start breathing heavier. What's funny is that just thinking about getting on a treadmill makes you breathe heavier. It must be a scare tactic. Oh my god, the treadmill. <gasps> right. And then voluntary control. You can breathe in, breathe out all you want because your cortex controls that. Remember, the cortex is your conscious awareness. So you can push out air to make words or songs or speak or whatever you want to do. Whistle while you work. But the funny thing is that you can't control a, you can't completely control stop breathing to the point where you die. I have never seen this happen, but I so bad want to see a kid hold their breath until they pass out. I just want to see that. Because as soon as you pass out, you lose conscious control, right? So what starts happening? Your brain stem starts subconsciously recontrolling it. It's like, whoa, there's too much CO2, we're gonna start breathing. So you can't actually kill yourself by holding your breath. And before we go, I have a couple minutes. I totally skipped over this. I talked about this a couple semesters ago. This is funny because this was like two semesters ago when I lost my phone. I went to the Botanical Center in, at the Des Moines Botanical Center, I guess it's Des Moines, and I took these pictures with my phone. I just thought they were really cool pictures. Um, and, while, and I love this. Anybody know the significance of the shirt? I was actually wearing this this morning, but it says Princeton Plainsboro Teaching Hospital. House, exactly. So it's a, a fictitious place. But while I was there, what I'm building up to is they have bonsai here. And when I was studying Eastern medicine, I thought bonsai were just so cool. And I wanted to have one. And when I went to buy one, I found out that bonsai isn't one specific 
tree. It's not like one plant. You can get any kind of bonsai you want. You can get an oak tree that's a bonsai. You can get a juniper tree that's a bonsai that smells nice. You can get little cherry trees or cherry blossoms that are bonsai. Bonsai is actually the way you grow the tree. So I was at the botanical center and they had all these different types of bonsai. Just tons of them all over. And this is actually in the botanical center. And it reminded me of something. And I always think of this when I'm kind of feeling discouraged because like my background. I grew up in Hillbilly, Illinois, and when I got out of high school, I thought I had to work in a factory because I was never smart enough to actually go to college. And when I learned about the bonsai tree, the bonsai tree are just like people. Is that you can take any tree, the way you plant it is bonsai. You put it in a little tiny pot, and it will restrict the growth of that tree. You can take the mighty oak tree. Like I thought, well, there's no way because you know the American oak tree is this powerful tree that grows 10 stories tall. There's no way in hell you can put it in a little tiny pot and limit its growth. It's got to be more powerful than that because that's my American ego, right? Does it work better than that? But what's interesting is that if you take an American oak tree and you put it in a little pot and you grow it and you grow it, it doesn't matter how long you keep it in that pot, that's as big as it gets. It will never grow to its full potential because you've limited it. If you listen to people that say, oh my God, this class is impossible and you're never going to get you know, an A or you're never going to do this or you're never going to do that, all you're doing is you're letting them put a pot around you and it's learning how high you can grow in the class. So when you're taking a test, just keep an open mind. Keep, take a step back away from it. Relax and know you've got everything you need to do well on that test. There's nothing, I promise you, there's nothing on the test that we haven't talked about in class. Will anything in the, will anything in the book that we didn't talk about in class beyond that test? No. Well, anything in the homework that I didn't talk about in class beyond the test? No. Study the lecture notes. You've got everything you need to, to do your best on this test. Don't limit yourself and think, well, God, you know, there's just, I'm never going to remember all this. There's so and so, they're really smart and they're smarter than me, so they didn't do get an A on that test. There's no way I'm going to do it. Don't limit yourself. Just be open minded when you're taking the test and relax. Your worst enemy is anxiety on these tests. So just chill out. And of course the test is on Tuesday. You know the routine now when you come in. You'll put your bags along the wall. You'll walk along here. I'll hand you the test and you're going to sit every other seat. So don't come in and get comfortable and spread out your pencils and your, your water and all that all over the table. You're, you're going to have to pack them up. All right. I will see you on Tuesday. Have a good weekend. Oh, by the way, what should be done by the time I meet you? Yep. So you should have your, all of your quizzes caught up by Tuesday when we come in here. Quiz 7 should be done.